All right, folks, welcome to another episode of Ape Answers. In this episode, number 16, we're going to talk a little bit about coil-loaded antennas and specifically about the Yesu ATOS antenna. Let's go ahead and take a look at the question that was proposed. So this question was asked over on the Toad's Discord by my buddy CS. And he said, is there any reason not to get the ATAS? Or get an ATAS, I should say. And I said, if it meets your needs, have at it. And there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about the ATAS antenna. It is uh, designed by Yesu for a very specific purpose. It's to be a portable antenna, or I should say mobile antenna, that's mounted to your vehicle. I have seen cases where folks mount these to railings on balconies and all other things and, and use them quite creatively. It's a very popular antenna and it's designed for a specific use case. Mobile antenna, that means it's very small and as a result it's coil loaded. The antenna also has the ability to be driven by the radio itself if it is a Yesu radio and it will adjust accordingly for your SWR depending upon the frequency that you are using. We'll take a quick look at that. One thing I want to mention is, is that I see a lot of reviews on this antenna and people hook it up and then they make some contacts. And when they make these contacts, they say, see, look, it works. It's great. It's a fantastic antenna. And it does work really well for its intended use case. But there are some drawbacks to coil loaded antennas that I wanted to uh, provide some commentary to here because it's an antenna that I am often asked about. So here's a couple of quick pictures of the ATOS antenna, and then you can see the coil at the bottom, and then you can see there is a whip component at the top. That coil will adjust its inductance depending upon frequency as we talked about. In the center of the screen, you can see this operator hanging out the window. I'm not sure that's entirely safe, and I hope he's not driving because that appears to be on the passenger side of the vehicle. But you can see the antenna mounted on the car, or in this case, a Jeep. Maybe it's not a Jeep. Anyhow, when you mount these antennas to your car, you do have to take care to make sure that it is grounded appropriately. That means connecting it to the frame of the vehicle and then making sure that all metal components on that vehicle are bonded together to give you an appropriate uh, ground plane. And then on the right hand side, you can just see a little bit more of a close up of the antenna. Let's take a look at DX Engineering's uh, description of this antenna so we can talk about it a little bit more. So I'm not going to go through all of this because it's a whole lot of words, but what's really nice about the antennas, and this is the model 120A, and they have a couple of different models. And the 120, I believe, is the power rating. I believe this is maximum power of 120 watts on single sideband CW at a 50% duty cycle. But what I wanted to highlight is that these are designed for mobile use. However, they can be adapted for base or portable operation with the appropriate mount and substantial counterpoise or radial wire system. And that's for that grounded that we talked about. Uh, down here it says that as with any HF, VHF, or mobile antenna, performance depends upon the grounding of the mount and bonding to the metal vehicle surfaces to create an optimal ground plane. And I think it should say sufficient ground plane because it's not an optimal ground plane when you use a vehicle as your ground. Okay, so what we want to do is talk a little bit about a half-wave dipole. And we're not going to talk about these in too much depth, so don't worry. Anyhow, half-wave dipoles are favored because they offer a combination of easy performance. They match very well. And they have predictable radiation patterns. They're really simple in their design and construction. And that makes them a go-to for amateur radio operators. Now, all antennas, and this is going to get the hand police upset, are either a half-wave dipole, a monopole, or a loop antenna. Any kind of antenna fits into one of those categories. And what's really helpful here is, is that the antenna has two sides. It has a radiating element, and then it has a ground or a shield side. And that offers balance on your antenna. And it gives you a really predictable uh, current distribution. And you have the maximum current at the feed point of this antenna, but uh, it really does play a key role in the antenna's performance. So let's talk a little bit about when we shorten an antenna. And that's what happens when we use these loaded coil based antennas like the ATOS. And so shortening an antenna makes it non-resonant on your intended operating frequency and introduces unwanted reactants. And what this does is it lowers your overall radiation resistance and efficiency. And when we talk about radiation resistance, what we're talking about is the amount of energy that makes its way to the antenna and then is con converted into RF and then propagated. And what we use is a matching network to help compensate for these issues. In this case, the matching network is a loading coil. 
And this loading coil, uh, what it does is it helps us have an efficient transfer of power from source to load, with source being our radio and load being our antenna. Without this matching network, we would have high SWR and we would have reflections that we need to deal with. These matching networks do come with a trade-off. Um, it's increased complexity and it's reduced bandwidth. And there's also the issue of loss. And the big reason I wanted to talk about this is that I generally do not hear anybody cover the limitations or the impacts of using coils on your antennas, on your shortened antennas. And I think it's something that's really missed in a lot of the reviews that I've seen for these types of antennas, or even just discussions about them in general. So when an antenna is physically short in terms of lay wavelength for the operating frequency, its reactance that we talked about is primarily uh, capacitive. So when we talk about the impedance of an antenna, impedance is its ohmic resistance plus reactance. And when we talk about resonance, it's just a ohmic resistant antenna, it's purely resistive, there is no reactance. React is, reactance is either inductive or capacitive in nature. And this is a phenomenon we see in AF, I'm sorry, AC current. So when we add the loading coil, it's added to cancel the capacitive reactance that we talked about by shorting this antenna and bring it into resonance. The inductor carries significant RF current, and this is even more pronounced in lower HF ranges where wavelengths are large. So any series reactance that we add from the coil directly turns that current into heat rather than radiated power. That radiated power is the radiation resistance that we talked about. You don't want your power converted into heat because you get nothing for it. So what we want to do when we build or design antennas is that we want to minimize ohmic or resistive losses. Um, that is a crucial component to antenna efficiency. So what I want to do here is I just want to talk a little bit about some coils. And I think this is like the JPL, JLP12 antenna coil. And you can see it's just a series of wire wrapped around a former. That's what that's called. And this one has this little slide piece that you, you move up and down right here. And by moving that, we create a connection here where we only use certain distance on this coil. We're only using part of this coil, not the whole thing. If we move it all the way up, then we're using the entire length of the coil. And then we, in, we adjust this to match the antenna to our frequency that we're operating on. This is another coil, and this is from a Gable radio. I think it's a 705 antenna. And what you do is you can loosen this, and then you, you can pull it out and adjust the length of your coil here, making this coil longer if you need more inductance, making it shorter if you need less inductance. With these antennas, they come with these shortened whips, and uh, just like the ATOS does. And then we connect these shortened whips to our antenna coil, in some cases, some of these antennas will come with a lower section. And what we do with this lower section is, is that we move this coil further up our antenna. So you have base loaded antennas and then you have center loaded antennas. In the case of this one, when we put this together, now our coil is at the center of our antenna. This allows more current to travel on the lower portion of, here's the name of the antenna on the lower portion of our antenna, allowing that current to radiate more efficiently. Once it hits this coil though, this coil does do that ohmic uh, heat exchange that we talked about earlier, and this is where the losses incur. Ideally, a monopole antenna, vertical antenna, doesn't have a coil, and it is a quarter wavelength long with an appropriate ground plane. That appropriate ground plane acts as that ground side of the dipole antenna that we talked about. So when we talk about the coil, unfortunately, size does matter. A larger coil in diameter or winding length generally helps with efficiency for two main reasons. The first one is reduced resistive or copper losses, losses in your coil. Thicker conductors can be used and this lowers your ohmic resistance. And a physically larger coil often requires fewer turns to achieve the same inductance depending upon coil geometry. Because the inductance rises with coil diameter, fewer turns means less total conductor length and then lower resistive losses. Another problem that comes up is reduced proximity or skin effect losses. So at HF, uh, HF, RF I should say, travels on the skin, on the outside of our conductors. 
and the depth that it does this at HF is really small. It's a few tenths of a millimeter at the higher HF frequencies. So with more space between your turns, when you use a larger coil, like a larger diameter, taller coil, <clears throat> the turns do not couple as tightly. And this reduces what's called proximity effect losses. And this is where current crowding can increase effective AC resistance. And it's really the magnetic field that builds around that coil interacts with each of the turns or the windings on the coil. They interact more when you use smaller wire closer together. So when designing coils for your antenna, a larger coil diameter with properly spaced turns and thicker wire has a higher Q. And it's lower total loss than small tightly wound coils that you see with thin conductors. When we have smaller portable antennas like the ATOS and the ones that I showed, this they're smaller tightly wound coils and so you have more losses it's just a, a tax that you pay for using these types of antennas I'm not saying the antennas are bad so everybody calm down if you have one and you love them and you think i'm a hater so what i wanted to do here is just show a quick picture my art skills are great aren't they and the one on the left is what we would call a base loaded antenna and then the one on the right is the center loaded antenna and then on the one on the right, you can see that we do have some radiating element below the coil that helps with current distribution, which is very important. So let's talk about where you should stick it. Uh, when we talk about base loading, they're easy to build and they're easy to tune, but they have the lower efficiency, especially on lower HF bands. And we just talked about this because it's inability to handle maximum current. With center loading, you have better efficiency than the base loading, but it's more complex in construction. If you have it mounted on your car, you have to deal with things like wind drag. If you do it uh, as, as a portable station out in the backyard or at the park, you have to make sure that you have a strong enough base that it's not going to tip over, and then you also have the component below the coil. Efficiency and complexity is a trade-off. So if performance or radiation efficiency is your goal, moving the coil up the antenna is more beneficial. If you need a more compact or simpler installation, particularly for mobile or portable setups, base loading may be the more practical option, and you're gonna accept more loss. And that's gonna wrap up this video. Hopefully it helps. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below. And remember, if you ask questions, you might be featured in a future episode of Ape Answers.